Hello, this is Sharon Fitzpatrick, the editor of Presentation Expert, and this is Dishin on Presentations, and I'm lucky enough to have Simon Raybould here with us, and he's in the UK where it's a wonderful 7.30 in the morning, and it's here 11.30 in California in the evening. <sighs> well, hello. I'm just kind of looking out the window, and 7.30 in the morning, the sun isn't even up yet, so we're, uh, yeah, it is ridiculously early in the morning over here. Yes, and it's ridiculously late over here. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for joining us. I really wanted to kind of get to know you a little bit better. And I was intrigued, especially because you have a science background. And I know you talk about the science of presentation. Yeah, I spent 24 years as a research scientist before I did anything else. Um, I have a, a PhD in, in geomedical statistics, which is honestly the most, uh, it is as boring as it sounds. But I spent 24 years as a research scientist and then as a manager of what was at the time, it was the UK's largest social science research unit. It was the second most influential research unit of its kind in the world. After MIT, and I, I kept trying to get transferred to MIT and it never happened. <laughs> so how do you go from that to presentations? Okay. Because the questions that I was being asked, most of my research was on contract to central government. And most of my, a lot of the questions I was getting asked came back a second or even a third time. Um, and after 24 years, you kind of expect that, but it became more and more obvious to me that the science wasn't the problem. The ability of scientists to explain what they were talking about was the problem. Because if we'd explained it properly five years ago, nobody would have needed to ask us the same question a second time. So we, we, were, we were researching um, urban policy, for example, which didn't necessarily get applied because politicians either didn't like it or didn't understand it. So if they come back to us and ask us to do the research again, either we've got to change the answers, which ain't going to happen because the data hasn't changed. I'm going to, you know, science is science and the rest of the politicians can go blow. Um, or we're going to have to explain it better. And I realized that the real problem was that science, social science in particular, was so far ahead of what people thought social science was that I then realized the most useful thing, the, most, the biggest contribution I could make to science and to society in general was to study the science of communication rather than the science itself, if you sort of mean. So um, I started working with scientists, exploring with them how better to explain what it was they were doing. And from there, it just kind of naturally blossomed out into a, uh, into a business for, for everybody. The one main theme I've heard this year, as far as presentation go, is the whole idea of storytelling becoming really an important part of the message, both visually and how people use words. It seems like science, in a way, you have to tell the right story in order to give the information that you're trying to communicate. Yeah, you do. Um, the, the problem most people have with presentations is, firstly, they don't know exactly what it is they're trying to do. I know it sounds really stupid, but you know, kind of most people have this idea that presentations are about something. Scratch that. Presentations are to do something and to, to change something. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, if they're about something, if they're about changing people's behaviors, the best way of doing that is to give people a story that they engage with. Because frankly, we learn better by stories. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting there should not be data. Hey, I'm a scientist. I have a PhD in statistics. <laughs> I believe in data. But the best way to get people to engage with data is to, is to find a way of linking with them at an emotional level. Now, it's okay to say stories are the way to do it. That's, that's not true. Stories are a way to do it. Absolutely. The thing, yeah. The key thing here is to get the emotional engagement with the data, with whatever it is you're trying to change. Stories are a good way. They're not the only way. And the key thing about stories is if, if you imagine the distance between my hand here and the floor is let's call it the tolerance, sort of your audience's response tolerance. In order to get them to change their behaviors, you need to be telling stories and having emotional engagements that push at, right at the limit, the threshold of what they will take offense at. Because the more emotional response they have, the more likely they are to respond to a story. And the risk you have as a storyteller, God help you if you do that. <laughs> if you go over their, their tolerance, that what they will accept, they just get offended. And nothing works. So your, your, your hard task as a storyteller is judging where that is and judging your story. I, it's really hard to demonstrate this. I'm hoping the camera kind of gets it. But yeah, you, you, you're you, doing a great job. Yeah. Well, um, it's easy if I stand up and do the whole thing, but you get the idea. It's just you, you want to be almost offending people. Right. But if you actually offend them, then they stop listening altogether. 
Um, so, for example, recently I, I was working in, in Leeds, but Leeds is 400 miles down to the south of me or something. And um, I used a very, very mild swear word. And I could see three members of my audience go, that's it, I'm not listening. Potty mouth, not listening. Now, it was, it was a, an incredibly mild swear word uh, to the point where I wouldn't even have complained if my 10-year-old children had used it. I might have just cautioned them about it, but I wouldn't have been angry about it. it was, um, and the reason I hesitate to tell you what it is is because I don't know culturally how offensive it would be in the States. So I kind of, but here in the UK, it was very, but these people were, and I'd lost them. There was three people who were gone. But for the rest of the audience, the other 47 people in the audience, it, it worked to bring me nearer their level and they engaged with me more because they saw the passion in what I was saying because I'd been so excited about it, I was prepared to mildly swear. Is that making sense? It, it makes total sense. And I think when you look at it, you always kind of in a way, the way I approach content, whether it be a story or a PowerPoint or any kind of presentation is you want to find a way to answer the question, what's in it for them? What is the audience going to get out of it so that they, you know, what do you want them to do? How are you going to engage? Because if they don't see what's in it for them, you've lost them even before you got to the square word. Absolutely. And I learned a fantastic thing on Friday from a um, United States Marine. Um, I was working with an, actually an ex-Marine. Um, and I, I suggest to people that when they try and design their presentation, they try and figure out the what's in it for them, for the audience. And to really focus their thinking, they narrow it down and get it into a tweet. Not in order to tweet it, but just the discipline of getting it into 140 characters is a, is a good discipline, is a good exercise. Uh, and uh, this Marine said that one of the things his unit used to do was exactly the same thing, but they wrote a haiku. Um, is it kind of, I've got this wonderful idea of Marines writing haikus about what their objective is, you know? <laughs> um, because it, it may, in order to create a haiku, you have to be very, very clear about what it is you're trying to say. Uh, and I kind, of, I kind of like that, partially because I've just got this weird image of, of great hardcore Marines writing haiku before they go into battle. I think that'd be really cool. Um, but also just because it's this, the, the discipline of figuring out what is it exactly, exactly I'm trying to change. Exactly what does my audience need? And here's the killer question for me. This is a personal opinion, though not a science one. Exactly how will I measure success? How do people respond to that? What the how do you measure success thing? Yeah. Um, most of them go into presentations thinking my definition of success will be to get out of here alive without embarrassing myself. And, and, and the result is that they design presentations defensively by, th by committing the cardinal sin, which I'm sure you've seen a million times. I'm sure all your listeners and readers and stuff have seen sometimes as well. It's to, to throw information at the audience. If I'm, if I'm defensively, if I'm trying to cover my backside so that nobody can, can complain about what I've done, the safest thing for me to do is just throw just throw shed loads of information at my audience and hope something sticks. It's, it's the old adage. We have a saying over here in the UK, nobody got fired for buying IBM. I, I don't know if that works in the States, you know, but, um, because baby, IBM are big and safe and they don't actually do anything and they're actually pretty boring and, and stuff, but it's a safe option. So we have this idea in presentations here that you just throw data and hope that something sticks. <laughs> um, my approach is different because that, doesn't work it's defensive you never win a game by playing pure defense so what i'm looking for people to do is to figure out exactly what it is they're trying to change and aim to succeed at that rather than trying to avoid failing on, on a defensive mindset I, it's far too in the morning i've explained that really badly i hope your listeners can try and translate that into something semi-coherent <laughs> I'm sure they can. But I'm, I'm not, but it's, it's nice of you to say so. <laughs> it makes sense, and, 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 it, and it's late for me, so it makes sense. So, um, okay. you know, I'll be sipping coffee in a few hours, but not, not <laughs> right away. So one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is that you had a different opinion um, than our last webinar speaker about intros. We talked mm -hmm. a little bit about it. Can you share and elaborate some of the things we had talked about, about your feelings about intro slides, or just do the, are they needed, or do you just go straight into content with no intro? I want to split the difference and be really, really difficult and introduce to you the concept of something called a credibility statement. 
the idea of the intro is to get your audience to sit down, shut up, pay attention, and think, okay, this guy's going to, or this girl is going to, or this robot is going to tell me something I need to know. And mm-hmm. I trust them to do it. So the, the point of the intro is to get your audience on side. Traditional intros don't do that because they go on for too long. Mm-hmm. And they give you a list of, um, for example, we've not gone through a list of all my jobs. You know, I've had, I've had lots. We haven't gone through them all. I've mentioned one of them, the one that's most relevant to this circumstance. I haven't mentioned being a lighting designer. I haven't mentioned being a fire eater. I haven't mentioned being a playwright or an actor or all of that kind of stuff. I've just, we have mentioned between us the science thing because that's the one that's most relevant now. So a credibility statement is a very, very simple form of introduction that is overwhelming, as in nobody can argue with it. It's just, oh my word, that's genius. And is objective, so it can't be argued with. So for example, as I have a friend of mine who, a guy called Mike Lever, he's a brilliant, brilliant trainer in sales. Now his introduction used to be, hello, my my name's Mike Lever. I'm probably the best sales trainer in the UK. And that was a rubbish introduction because people could have argued with him. Mm -hmm. Okay, they could have a different opinion. Now his introduction is, hello, my name is Mike Lever. I've just been voted the best sales trainer in the UK. Fabulous, brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It means the same thing, right. but, but now you can't argue with it because it's a simple statement of fact. It's I have been voted. Brilliant. And at that point, everybody goes, okay, this guy really knows his, his stuff. I'm going to sit down and shut up and listen. Well, my personal favorite is a client of mine who, who talks about self-discipline with kids. And I be very careful not to give you give you her name but she she goes on stage and goes hello my name is x i have four black belts three of them at top dan <laughs> okay but remind me not to argue with you um not twice anyway because this is the, and, and all that does is is give the audience enough confidence to be able to um to trust what that person is going to say, to know that what that person is going to say is worth listening to. Mm-hmm. It establishes their credibility like that, but it doesn't go on. It doesn't sound like they're trying too hard. It just gives you enough to go, oh, and you're done. And that's it. And then you move on to content. That sounds like, you know, you're going to make me rethink my intro for webinars going forward. <laughs> webinars are slightly different. Um, because they're, they're a much more passive medium, people often tend to be doing something else at the same time. And if you demand a really high level of concentration from them, sometimes they can't give it because they kind of, if it's a choice between what they're doing over here and listening to you, what they're doing over here is a real thing and you're an electronic thing so that you'll be the one that loses. So just reducing it a little bit on webinars is, is not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the reasons why you try and do interactivity as a major part of webinars is because you want to really engage them and keep them going and give them a reason to pay attention because they do multi multitask and go to webinar. I look at the attention meter and want to go, please pay attention. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and to be fair, I do the same thing. Yeah. If I've got a webinar on, in fact, um, one of the things I've got in my, in my di- ca- diary this morning is to listen to a marketing webinar from two friends of mine. And I know, I just know in my heart of hearts that while they're doing that, uh, they're going to be on this big old Mac monitor in front of me here. While they're doing that, bigger than life size, I will be tidying my office at the same time. Right. Um, you know, I'll be putting my green screen away for starters. <laughs> you can ship it to me. I could use one. <laughs> you go. Know, there it is. It, you'd have thought I'd been organized enough to put it up behind me for the evening, but no. <laughs> so there was a, a whole thing about data, uh, about short attention span. That, and you kind of said it was rubbish or garbage. Yep. I, I, yes, I, was probably, I think I was trying to be politer than I felt. Yes. There was, <laughs> did that come through? Yes, uh, it did. Actually, the, okay. other, the other commenter was not as polite as you were. Okay, well, the, the thing about that is one of the things that really fires me up as a, a presentation specialist, as a, as a trainer in, in presentations, is that people believe an awful lot of what they're told without checking the veracity of it, without checking the provenance of the, of the, of the data. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of the stuff that is, quotes common knowledge is stuff that's just been, frankly, pretty much made up. The experiments, the goldfish experiments barely happened. They didn't happen in the way that people think they did. This is the stuff about attention spans with mm-hmm. goldfish. 
they were badly designed experiments. You can't infer from them. And God help us, if you try and infer from a person, from a, sorry, from a goldfish to a person, then frankly, you're an idiot. I mean, there's, there's no way you can make that kind, of, that kind of behavioral analysis. The stuff that we were talking about in terms of people's attention spans in the presentations, most of that is derived from their behavior on websites. Because, okay, people look at a website and you can measure how quickly they click away from a page on a website. But really, if you look at a website and you click away from it in, in 6, 20 or 30 seconds, does that really tell you anything about how long you're going to pay attention to a live trainer who's in the room in front of you talking about it? Does it help? No. It tells you about how badly designed websites are. Or it didn't have the content you were looking for, yeah, yeah, so you're writing absolutely. it off and going to the next one. Yeah, exactly. So you, yeah. you can't infer from people's online web behavior, but that's what people are trying to do when they say, oh, the attention span of the human being is X, Y, Z. That, you know, I've, I've given presentations for 90 minutes, and people have come to me at the end and gone, I didn't blink, I didn't breathe, I was fascinated all the way through. On the other hand, I've given presentations of 20 minutes, and God, even I've been bored, let alone the audience. It's, it's, a, it's a question of what you're delivering and how you're delivering it. You can get people to concentrate for a much, much longer period of time than some of the claims would suggest. Yeah, I would agree with you. I think, you know, the goldfish idea of the nine seconds or whatever it was was really Six. interesting. But I do think it was a little stretch as far as that goes, because I think you can't really tell. A lot depends on how engaging you are as a speaker, how good your content is, and what the interest level is. Yep. There's some really uh, interesting papers in the, I think you mentioned you've got, um, got a, a, a book there, and there's some really interesting papers I cite in the book, which is a, a recent experiment from the States where they gave people clickers uh, in lectures, and they said that people were to click every time they realized they had not been paying attention. Mm. So you can't spot when people stop paying attention, but you can spot when they realize that they, you know, when they start paying attention, oh shit, I, I, I didn't listen, click. Or, and they, or they go, I realized I zoned out for a long time there, click, click. Uh, and the, the, the pattern analysis of that suggests that the idea of, of uh, a fall off in attention span is just nonsense. People's attention spans go up and then in a much, much more complicated way than a simple. So this, we have this idea, uh, this theory of something called the forgetting curve where people start paying attention at the beginning and it goes down and stuff. There's no, there's no evidence for that that I can find at all. I mean, there might be some that I haven't found, but I've done quite an extensive bit of literature review for it. Instead, people start to lose attention at three minutes and come back at nine. They pay attention until 18 and disappear till, the, till minute 21. And then they come back and pay attention to minute 90. And then they disappear for five minutes. You know, it's, it's a, a much, much more chaotic pattern than, than some of the simple models suggest. It's so chaotic that actually we can't yet model it. Yeah. Now, coming from a PhD in statistics, for me to admit that, that, that really annoys me because I want to be able to model something. That's what I did for 24 years. But for me to say, you know, we, we, just, we just haven't found a way of, of, of modeling it that's generalizable. Uh, other claims that people make, uh, you'll have come across, I'm sure, the, the myth of the 7% idea that only 7% of communication is in the words. That's nonsense as well, but people believe it because they haven't bothered to check the research. Um, the VAK model, pretty much nonsense, but again, people believe that because they haven't bothered to check the research. It's... It gets me cross. <laughs> I, I look a lot to really understand what is, even from a webinar perspective, what is good attendance versus registration? What is the industry average? What, should, what day of the week is better than other days? And so you have to really kind of take some of the data with a grain of salt and, and decide what works for your audience and decide how to engage your audience so that they you do have their attention. Yeah, and you can spot, if you're looking at attention spans on webinars, you, you've got more data there to play with because you've got the, were they multitasking? What else, what other buttons did they click at the same time? Were they reading their emails and that kind of jazz? So you've got data. And if you can spot patterns in that data, then absolutely hit it. And you use that, absolutely. It's much harder to do that for live presentations because you don't have that multitasking information. You can't tell if the person who's staring at you is asleep with their eyes open um, or is actually wrapped, you know, they haven't blinked for 10 minutes. Is that because they've died or, or is that because they're desperately attentive? It's, it's much harder in live presentations sometimes. 
I noticed on, the, on your website that you do do a lot of online webinars or you're starting to. Yeah, we're starting to. We're starting to. We haven't done a lot in the past uh, because I'm a, I'm a specialist in live presentations and I've, I've tended for no really good reason to fight shy and I've, I've tended to just concentrate on live. Um, we're having to move much more into online stuff now. What you would advise people or our readers to to make sure they do in order to be successful in online presentations? More stuff. Okay, I, it's, it's a very simple, simple phrase, more stuff. Um, I can tell a story on stage and have people fascinated for about 10 minutes at a time with a black slide behind me. And I will deliberately put on a black slide so that they pay attention to me and I almost dance the story as, as a professional storyteller. You can't do that on a webinar. <laughs> you have to have stuff happening. Hmm? Um, now, I'm going to step away from the science just for a moment because as far as I'm aware, there isn't any and give you my personal experience, which suggests that you want something to happen every 10 or 20 seconds. Now, it may just be an additional point of information on your slide, mm -hmm. but something has to happen to keep people going. And I've seen webinars where there's been the same slide for two minutes at a time. Well, because people don't have your face to look at, they just have the slides. Two minutes starts to starts to bore them, no matter how fascinating the slide is. The other thing to, to bear in mind with a, a, an online presentation is that all the rules of not overloading people with data, with bullet point stuff, <laughs> when you go for live presentations, those rules seem to apply slightly less for webinars because people can read really comfortably and again because they don't have your face distracting them they just have a screen full of, of, of stuff they can take in information visually uh, much more than they can if they're if they're live so long as the presenter is not saying exactly the same thing as is on the screen yeah that would be do not read the slides <laughs> I, I would go first do not read the f slides there's a, there's a, a really rude adjective in, in in there as far as I'm concerned. Well, fill in the blank. <laughs> Maybe you get a bleep on that one. You know? <laughs> uh, but it's, it, you'd be amazed at how many people do because they're particularly novice presenters. They know that they can put data, more data up on the screen, so they do, and it becomes very seductive. I've got what looks effectively like a script on the screen in front of me because I've got nine bullet points worth of data. Unless you're really super confident and unless you have rehearsed saying something different, it's it's very tempting to start to read this to read the slides. Well, I was going to say I, I I've done enough to probably fill a book at some point, which I should do. But yeah, definitely. <laughs> one of the things that I do is I don't ever read a script. I look right. for an outline, and then I look and look at the audience and bring in real examples in order to explain. It. So it's not just the concept of you know, death yeah. by PowerPoint. How can we change it? Let's take X person and take it through their PowerPoints and figure yeah. out how it works. Something we're experimenting with at the moment is having two of us deliver the webinar and have two cameras or have a camera involved at the presenter mm -hmm. and put them picture in picture so that somebody, so it's almost like we're running a live presentation. Right. Um, so somebody else runs the slides. My assistant Claire will run the slides while I do the will I do the delivery? Mm -hmm. And that means that there's absolutely nothing in my head that wants to concentrate on the slides. Right. And I, it, we don't know if that's going to be viable yet because obviously the cost of doing that doubles because I have to have Claire with me right. when I'm doing it. Um, if we can find a way of automating that, that would be fantastic. Uh, but with that's something we're experimenting with at the moment. We haven't, we haven't released any of those yet because it's, it's at the, basically, frankly, it's at the experiment stage. And there's 10 minutes in, it all goes horribly wrong. And then I turn to Claire and go, what the hell are we doing there? And, <laughs> or actually, that's not the way around it goes. Usually Claire looks at me and goes, what? <laughs> um, so we're still experimenting. We're still practicing. We haven't gone, we haven't gone live with those. Um, what we have done, however, is experiment with, a little, with lots of little short video clips. We've got mm -hmm. lots of, of, of short tips and things online on our YouTube channel. Um, using a little piece of software, the same software that Steve Dotto uses. Do you know, do you know Steve mm -hmm. Dotto? Yeah. Um, using the same software as he does so that we, we can show people how to do something using Keynote or PowerPoint or something. Right. And there's this little picture of me tucked away in the corner right. talking about it. So um, now those are not webinars, they're training videos. But again, we're starting to experiment with those. 
And it seems to be working well for us to have this combination of a live person and the presentation at the same time. Yeah, I mean, I, I love the technology we're using today because you do get a chance. I get to see you. So I, I feel like this is a conversation. It's not just a let me talk and be very well. <laughs> the, only, the, the only downside, I mean, no offense by this, I've got such a big screen and I have you on a full screen, you're actually bigger than life size. And it's, it's, it's a little bit scary. <laughs> well, <laughs> what can I tell you? <laughs> this, this redhead I've never met before and her head's this big. <laughs> So that's perfect. I love it. So 2017 is coming up. And so what I'm going to do in January is kind of do a compilation of video tips. And what do you think is going to happen in 2017 with presentations, communication? Give me your top five. What I think is going to happen and what I hope is going to happen. Let's okay, do the, both. Let's do both. Okay. What I think is going to happen is, is more of the mind numbing same. And I, I don't think people will learn. Uh, what I hope is going to happen is that some of the technologies will change things spectacularly and shake things up quite a lot. So we're using, uh, we're using some interesting software right now, but there's a lot of variations that are coming out on that theme, which allow people to do much more informal presentations much more easily. So they can literally just click a button and bang, and they can go live to as many people as, as follow them. And those pieces of software get integrated now with YouTube and so on. So anything works much more informally. For me, I think the upside of that is that it's a, in the same way as the internet in general democratized and de-skilled delivery of content information, this will democratize and de-skill delivery of proper presentations so that anybody with something important to say can say it. That's the upside. The downside is that any half wit without anything important to say can also say it. Mm. And the hard part is going to be, as it always is on the internet, sorting the wheat from the chaff, sorting those people who know what they're talking about from those people who are blowhards and just put out bang, 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 load content after content after content. The people who can play the Google game as opposed to the people who have something to say. And the people I really, really want to work with are those who have something to say rather than who have to say something. So for me, I think it's going to be a really interesting year as the technology explodes and we see where, we see where all of that goes. I, I, think, uh, I think I was going to say, I think it's, it's almost like the technology needs to become very utilitarian in a way because you, it just wants to be another way to deliver content but you want to also use the technology to engage your audience and make sure that you use the best that the technology has to offer. Absolutely. I can give you a personal example, if you like. I experimented yesterday with Facebook Live, and I put something up just a, a, a less than a minute long, showing people what I was doing on my company's Facebook page, showing people what I was doing to prepare for a presentation I was giving. And I kind of I showed them how I'd got my laptop set up, and I showed them how I'd got the room set up, um, I told them what music I was playing and why I was playing it. Um, I showed them how I was dressed and why I was dressed like that. All of that in less than a minute. And it was still an hour out from when the audience were due in so they could see how in advance prepared I was. Um, but it was shockingly bad quality. <laughs> 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 because I had just, I'd got, I thought, you know, I've got an hour and I can either have a cup of tea or I can try and do something helpful. I've got an iPhone, I've got a Wi-Fi connection, bang, and I just went up, hooked in a little um, Rode Lavalier mic just to get a bit of uh, better sound quality into my iPhone, and, and, and away I went. Whether that's a useful thing to do or not, I don't know, because it gives people information, and I hope, and people said, seem to have seemed to have liked it, but I don't know for sure whether really utilitarian delivery like that is actually going to be helpful or not. That's one of the things I think we're going to find out in, in 2017. Does just bang, bang, bang delivery, does that help? Or does, do we need something better crafted? Honestly, don't know. Well, I think some of that too is, is in a way, by doing that on Facebook Live, you give your audience or your potential audience a chance to get to know who you are. The, the side of you that's that's not on before you go on. So they really get to know a little bit about you and oh, well, it's, scene, so. it's, it's interesting you say that. Now, I, uh, this is going to sound rude, so bear with me. 
uh, please don't take offence until the end of the paragraph. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't know whether that attitude is because you're American or because you're an extrovert or because of your Irish heritage or whatever. But for me, for me, when I go on stage, I go on stage to deliver the best content I can deliver. And what my audience sees on stage is a different person from what they see off stage. I go on stage, I perform, I come off stage, I'm a person. And that's because psychologically, I'm, I'm very introverted. I get my energy from being inside my own head. In fact, um, I did a gig a couple of weeks ago. Um, and it was the first time my wife had seen me perform in about two and a half years. And two interesting things happened. The first was that when I came off stage, she went, okay, where did Simon go? Because um, the person on stage was relaxed and comfortable and confident and, and bouncing ideas around. Off stage, I barely say two words. Yeah. And the other thing that happened was that when the audience started to come towards me to say, that was brilliant, can I have this? Could you sign this? Could I buy a book? What do you think of so-and-so? My wife was, was, was just genius at getting between me and them <laughs> and answering those questions on my behalf just for five minutes to give me time to get my head back in the game because I, I come off stage absolutely exhausted because it's for me it's very, very draining. For me, it's all about delivering the value message to the audience. And that knackers me. Oh, interesting. Now, different people work in different ways, but for me, it's incredibly knackering. I've forgotten why I said that. Now, see, it was relevant when I started telling that. I've forgotten why. <laughs> no, no, it's interesting because I am definitely an extrovert, and I think that when you get to topics that I love and I'm passionate about, that I feel confident about, that's going to come across. And it really, when there are topics I'm not so comfortable with or ones that I find really boring, that's when I have a challenge with delivering. And getting that can, I, can I play devil's advocate then? Play devil's advocate. If you're ever making a presentation and you're not confident of the content, why? If you aren't confident that the content is good and you know it, get off the stage. You have no right to be there. A lot of times I'm delivering content that's important to a client and I'm actually... Oh, okay. Right. So it's a little bit different yeah. from that perspective. Yeah. You know, yeah. I have a client who has really technical, technical content. I have no idea. I have to struggle with and learn in advance some of the names of things because they're not ones I'm comfortable with. And I find that it's one of the best things about my job. I absolutely adore that because one, one day I can be working with the, the head of internet security for the head of internet security for a very large company. I nearly <laughs> accidentally spilled the beans there. Uh, and the next day I'm working with medical researchers and the next day I'm, and I've got to keep my, I've, you know, I, I learn about what their jobs are right. and I learn about what they do. I, I it absolutely fascinates me. I really, really enjoy that. I, I have the same. I have a, a wellness company that I'm taking all of their in-person webinars or in-person trainings and making them webinars so they can deliver them by webinars. And that means training the speakers to figure out how to engage with an audience, hmm. building everything up. Simon, you have a book out. Presentation Genius. <laughs> Tell us about I have, it. <laughs> I have a book out called Presentation Genius. It came out ooh, uh, a year and a bit ago. It hit number six in the business bestsellers charts here in Europe. Um, I like to think that what it does is take it's taken 400 bits of research it written in academies and hardcore statistics, translates them into English so that people can figure out how to apply them to making their presentations. So it's very, very much the science of what works, the science of how to design your slides, the science of when to use images and all of that kind of jazz. I think in the entire book, I give people my personal opinion three times, but I actually flag it up as, this is my opinion. <laughs> Other than that, it's just an interpretation of, of hardcore research science. So if I read it again, because I've read it once, will I be a genius? Genius level response, not guaranteed. It says that in the small print. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, Simon, for joining and dishing with us on presentations. And have Absolutely. a very, very happy holiday. And I've really enjoyed it. And, and have a great time yourself. It's been yes. an absolute blast. I've really loved it. Yeah, me too. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.